All right, thank you all for joining us today as we hear from Ed Atkinson at the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden, also known as the Cincinnati Botanical Garden and Zoo. We're very proud to have him here today. He was an intern with us in 2020 and has been working at the Cincinnati Zoo in the last two years or so and uh, is a horticultural manager there in charge of the grounds and whatnot, various projects that keeps the chaos of the zoo uh, running smoothly. So without further ado, we will turn it over to Ed. You're gonna end up with a much different soil than um, what these plants are used to. And I mean, this stuff is still like, there's still nutrients in it. I mean, if you, you would be amazed at this kind of stuff you can send off to an extension for a soil test and it'd come back like you, you'd think it was like bag topsoil. The missing element is that community that is churning up those nutrients and making them available. Um, another big difference, I, I think we are all aware of this, is uh, white-tailed deer and their overabundance. Um, so, you know, it's pretty obvious to most people that we have pretty much pushed out. I mean, there's here or there. I've seen pictures of uh, mountain lions on people's pool covers and, and stuff like that. But for the most part, these are, are gone or pushed way out to the fringes. Um, and another thing that's kind of happened is we, you know, we started around this time moving more to, you know, farmed sources for meat instead of hunting the deer. So there was actually a point in time not that long ago that white-tailed deer were, you know, almost on the brink of extinction. And so to think now that that ever occurred is, is pretty wild. Another thing that you kind of don't always think about is um, a lot of suburban landscapes are kind of their preferred habitat. They don't like deep woods because there's not a bunch of cover. They feel exposed. They don't like, you know, grasslands and things like that because, again, they feel exposed. They like kind of that interplay between the two. And when it's constantly like, you know, constant interplay between different lots and things like that, it's, you know, we've made a lot of their home, taken away a lot of their predators. Um, so that is why there are so many of them and they wreak havoc both in the woods, mess up with the recruitment of new trees by just eating them and eat a lot of our landscape plants. Pollution is a big one that, you know, these plants have not evolved with, you know, carbon dioxide or, you know, carbon monoxide and all these and soot and all these things in mind. Um, and that, you know, it can be air pollution, it can be, you know, oil coming off the road, things getting spilled, lead, all these sorts of things that, you know, they're not accustomed to. And a big one is, of course, road salt. Um, changing, you know, like I was saying, that soil structure, it degrades soil structure, it can be toxic, you know, a lot of plants need a little bit of sodium, but, you know, poison and, and medicine, the difference is dosage, of course, and that is a very high dose. So, you know, kind of the benefits of native plants. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on with native plants. There's a lot of talk and it, you know, at first it seems really, uh, really straightforward. I mean, we've got here, you know, Kentucky dogwood, Kentucky kernel dogwood, actually. And, you know, imagine my surprise when this comes from Japan. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of, you'll hear different things about native plants that they don't need fertilizer, they don't need, you know, pesticide, they don't need extra water, um, which is true. That's true of a lot of non-native plants as well. Um, some to a fault. Um, I, I can guarantee you right now that no one is driving down the highway fertilizing all of the Hummer honeysuckle. Um, so what, you know, why, what, if, you know, that stuff is, is true, but, you know, if it's not unique to them, what, what is unique to them? Why, why bother? Um, it's their interaction with wildlife. When you use native plants, your goal is generally to um, make your yard a better place for wildlife. There's different, you know, host plant interactions, meaning that um, some sort of invertebrate, usually an insect, is some stage of its life cycle is being spent eating one of these plants. Um, some of them are so specific, it's 
not even like the genus of plant, it is like down to the species. So um, having the, all of these plants in your yard is going to help you create this big food web. And also, you know, berries for birds, seeds that they can eat through the winter, things like that. Um, and you really shouldn't start, you know, just like, you don't have to like start from, you know, just demolish everything and start over. You know, well-behaved, low-input, non-native plants are not, they're not pieces of plastic. They're not, you know, they're providing benefits to you, but just use them as a, a starting point, you know, to yeah. springboard off into, you know, just adding diversity to that landscape. Because the more diverse things you have, you have this bug is growing on this plant that's eating that plant when it grows up or, or you know, eating the bug that grows up on this plant, that grows up on that plant, that grows up on that plant, that grows up on that plant. And they're helping, you know, you're building this food web that, you know, for one, um, you're not going to have a giant party with like one sleeve of Ritz crackers. So, you know, <laughs> birds are not going to come to your house if you have one, if you have like five of one kind of caterpillar. Um, they need all different kinds. And then on, you know, that lower level, when you have this big diversity of plants in your landscape, they're going to help man manage each other before you know, any of the, one of these players can get to biblical levels and start really devouring your plants. Um, they're keeping each other in check. You know, the thing that eats them rises up and keeps them under control, keeps them under control. So the more diverse the landscape is, the more resilient it's going to be as well. Um, so there's a couple kind of exceptions. Um, when you're looking for different, you know, you know, if you're, finding cultivars and things. So basically Doug Palmy, kind of the guru of native plants right now, um, did a study on this of, you know, the pollination and host plant capabilities of native plant cultivars. And what he found is there wasn't a real whole big difference except for two things is when you really, really mess with the, the flower morphology. So that white flower there, that's a purple cone flower that, um, it's called like a pom-pom sometimes. Um, so that is a fully double flower, which means that all of the nectar and pollen producing parts of that flower have basically been miscoded on a DNA level as um, petals, extra petals. Um, obviously you take away the nectar and the pollen. Uh, that being said, and you know, uh, other plants that aren't kind of that like disc aster flower, um, they'll look kind of, Think of like a tea rose where it's just all petals and there's none of those like little yellow anthers that you can see. Um, there's what's called a semi-double flower where those parts aren't obscured. So you kind of just have to look for the little, um, those little yellow anthers. And I mean, as you can see there on those leaves, there's a lot of foliage damage, something's eating it. If you really, you know, if this is your thing, then by all means, it's not, it's not a piece of plastic. It's not a rock. Um, if you have your kind of, if you have other things in your yard that are blooming at that time, you can have, you know, a couple of these, but like, if you're trying to make a pollinator garden and you've got all double flowered plants, it's not going to work. So, um, the other thing they found is things that have purple or red leaves. Um, that's caused by compounds called anthocyanins. They're a natural, um, they make the leaves more bitter and harder to digest. It's the plant's way of deterring uh, insect herbivores. Obviously, if you're trying to attract insect herbivores to be raised on your plants, that's gonna reduce that. That being said, you know, anecdotal, um, I had a bunch of cuttings of Purple Tower Cottonwood that I almost lost last year to things eating them. There's herbivory damage on this sumac here. It's reducing it's not eliminating it, you know, you're not a monster for having one of these in your, in your yard, if you want that. Um, you know, does your yard have to look like this to have native plants? Well, I mean, I talked to so many people um, who that, you know, for whatever reason, they get this impression and they're, you know, I talk to people that are like scared to death. They're like almost in tears telling me like, I just, you know, I'd want to do the right thing and have these native plants and, you know, and 
I'm going up to my neighbors and I'm knocking on their door and telling them about like what I'm trying to do and please don't report me to the township or please don't tell the HOA, you know. And I mean, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, they're just plants. And um, so formal as like a gardening style does not, it's not a specific palette of plants. Um, we've kind of, as a society, like been told that like these plants that Europeans used 300 years ago to make formal gardens, that that's the only thing that can be formal. Um, and I just, you know, it's, it's not right because formal is a style of design and techniques of maintenance. It doesn't have to do with the plant material itself. Um, this is, I got to go to Austin, Texas recently. Um, I brought back some of the weather for us. Um, uh, this is the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and this is a little formal garden that they've done. Um, again, it's Texas native plants, but I think it just even further goes to show that like you can have a formal garden. It, it's just a technique. It's the right angles, the shearing, you know, the placement, the symmetry. It doesn't have to do with this plant or the other. And I, I feel like, you know, you get a lot of we as gardeners, we as horticulturalists, landscapers, we get a lot of flack for like, you're dumping all these chemicals on stuff and you're, you know, doing this and that. And I, that really comes from those plants that, that, you know, like these European plants of the past that we've associated with, with formality that, um, you know, aren't as adapted to where we are. And so I think it's, you know, about time that we kind of define for ourselves, like, what is the plant palette of formality? Um, so this is from Michael Durr, Dr. Michael Durr, big, you know, like the guy for woody plants. Um, this is from his manual, Woody Landscape Plants. So he says, in the 1990 edition, I mentioned it did not withstand pruning as well as Carpinus betulus. He's talking about Carpinus carolinea at the American Hornbeam. Uh, recent discoveries indicate that Car Carpinus caroliniana is readily prunable and pleachable and will serve as a hedge, screen, or formal element. So other people are, you know, are catching on to this too. Um, you can espalier, topiary, um, coppice. This is one of my favorite, that pokeweed uh, right there. That's one of my favorite pictures. Um, we call that the pokey ball. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look half bad for <laughs> you know, somebody shearing a pokeweed. <laughs> um, variegation, all sorts of, you know, crazy stuff. This is Painter's Palette Jump Seed. Um, you can see why it gets the name Jump Seed. It's definitely something you want to let kind of ramble, but a very cool thing if you like that. Um, this is uh, outside of Louisville. This was designed by Rick Dark, um, who wrote a book with Doug Talmy. Just a really cool um, semi-formal, like, woodland garden using all native plants. Uh, kind of a note on the maintenance side of things. Um, you want to leave these things until late winter, early fall. You want to leave like your perennials up. You want to leave as much leaf debris in the beds and things like that as you can, because that's where all of your birds and turtles and things are taking cover. Um, the insects are living inside of those stems. They've laid their eggs on different things. And um, I like this little, well, you know, like I said, some of us are in a really strict HOAs, or we just don't like that look, you know, maybe as sort of a compromise to that, like, you don't have to build like a full on bug hotel as much as I love this thing. Um, but maybe you just have like a screened off little corner of the yard where you throw some logs and you throw, you know, instead of just bagging up everything in the Home Depot bag and having it sent off, you throw some of this stuff back there and, and kind of, you know, you can have that kind of look, some of the look and some of the the benefits if that's not you know your style or it's not a reality for where you are where do i buy native plants i get this a lot like the nurseries don't have native plants and i they you know people have been asking this more and more and more and more and more and nurseries and garden centers are listening they have a lot of native plants up and they're getting more and more so and they want the things that you want because you'll buy them so one great place, uh, Boyer Farm. 
This is out just north of Cincinnati in uh, Mason. So this will start up probably in about late spring. You can go to um, Cincinnati Zoo website. You just go to the gardens tab and then the botanical events and plant sales. You can sign up. Um, the only reason we ask that you sign up is parking out there is very limited. Um, so we like to have a good, not a good idea of about who's coming. Um, but I mean, if you drove by and it said it was full, but there's like parking there, nobody's checking. So, you know, you can come on out. They've got a lot of really cool, like straight species stuff and things that you can't find, you know, a lot of kind of niche native stuff that's pretty hard to find. Um, and just a really nice, nice setup, a nice time. Um, Woody Warehouse, this is, um, this is kind of a hike. It's up near uh, Indianapolis, like a little north of Indianapolis, um, but just really good, obviously woody plants, but just really solid selection, really well produced stuff. Um, I got to tour their nursery and I, I was really impressed. Um, it's technically wholesale only, but if you call them and you know what you want, they don't quite have the staff to like walk around with you and everything. But if you already know what you want and you give them a call, tell them, you know, this is what I want. They'll pick it for you. You can pick it up or try to, you know, figure out some arrangement and, and take it back. Um, and just like I said, there's all sorts of garden centers. White Oak Gardens, if you're on the west side, is a good place. Danny McEwen Blumens, north of town. Native Roots is in Anderson on the east side. Um, that's actually started by a guy who used to work at the zoo. Um, Kevin Drick and Odell. Um, Kevin Odell is a great friend of mine, just a really knowledgeable person. He can help you track down some, some crazy stuff. And Ammon Nursery right across the street. Tons and tons, you know, I've looked through their availability. They've got tons and tons of native plants, different native cultivars, natorps as well. Um, so, I mean, they're they're out there and they're getting more and more. People are breeding more and more with them because the demand is there. So just keep asking for these things and, and you'll find them. So, ooh. so that says, where do I, you know, find information on native plants? Hopefully that goes away here a second. Um, so there's a few websites and you don't have to like write all these URLs down and stuff. If you, you know, Google like the name of a native plant, I guarantee you these are going to be three of the top four websites that come up. Um, but just so you know, um, this is the, like I said, the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. Um, they have a lot you know, obviously it's in Texas, but they have a lot of good information on just Midwest native plants in generally. Um, so uh, it's just wildflower.org as well, but you can see there's just different names of it, different kind of facts about it, histories. This is more, this isn't quite how you garden with it, but it can give you kind of an idea of where it occurs and things so you can kind of emulate that in your own landscape. Like this thing grows in a dry prairie. This would probably like dry full sun kind of thing. Um, this is Missouri plant, Missouri Botanic Garden. Um, this is their plant finder. It's a, uh, you can use this. It's pretty cool. Um, you can kind of check the boxes and, you know, like deer resistant, native, you know, full sun, and it'll kind of find things for you. Mostly what I do is I just go Google, I've been to Google, the name of the plant, Mobot, and uh, it'll usually come up. And it's got these really good pages for pretty much everything that you could ever want to grow in a garden. That's, you know, it has common names, what family it's in, where it likes to grow, tips about, you know, just how to grow it, some little history about it, botanical information, just a really concise but really helpful resource. Um, another one, the NC State Extension. Um, it's it's pretty similar to um, the Missouri Botanic Garden. It's just a lot of information about the plant, maybe why it's named that, or um, and then just tons of information about where it occurs and what it would like in a garden situation and things like that. So that's just a really helpful resource. Um, is there is there something that I can get that to go that go up? 
screen bins and you're sharing your screens and set up top and you can't really get rid of them. So well, you can see most of that. So that's manual of woody landscape plants by Michael Ader that I wouldn't buy like the um the brand new sixth edition if you get like the uh like a used fifth edition, not really much has, has changed. Like the botanic names have changed and some of Mike Durr's opinions, but it's not super uh, important. And those are, are much more affordable because this is often used as like a, a textbook. So textbooks are not cheap. Um, There we go. Um, another one, Weeds of the Northeast, is just a really good reference book for, you know, this would be like if I was, this would be really handy if I was kind of making a naturalized portion of my yard and I was like, you know, things start volunteering and coming up and I'm trying to figure out, is this good? You know, is this native or not? Is it like dog bane or something where it's going to be really, it's native, but it's really aggressive. Maybe I like, you know, don't want that take completely over. So it's just got really good, like full color photographs of everything from seeds to, you know, adult plants and all sorts of different information on what, you know, what they are. So um, we'll finally get into uh, the, the list portion of the, the thing, but we'll kind of tell you a little bit about what you're looking for in terms of a good candidate for shade. Um, it's basically the stuff that's going to occur in the understory. This one's pretty easy. There's not a lot of nuance to that, but um, smooth hydrangea, hydrangea arborescence, also called wild hydrangea. Um, this is a nice little uh, well-behaved understory plant. Um, likes, you know, as much moisture as you can give it, but they can go pretty dry um, in shade at least. Um, I like kind of the wild, more wild types than the, you know, they're just a little less formal and a little less, a little rambly for more like woodland applications, but there's the big mop head ones if you want to use them more formally. Um, really cool flowers. Like they said, there's ones that are just these big domes of those like outer uh, flowers that you see there and not the little center ones. Woodland stone crop, sedum ternatum. This is a cool one. You can find one. It's called like Larinum Park, um, usually. Um, it's a it's a sedum, but it's like a it's much more tolerant. You know, you think sedum, you're like full sun, dry, rocky. Um, this one actually kind of follows like the water courses in shade. Um, got this beautiful spring bloom right on time with the ephemerals. Um, it's just it's one of my favorite little things. Virginia creeper is a good, like, um, yeah, but it's just kind of a good thing to, you know, it'll climb trees pretty innocuously. It's not like English ivy or something where it's going to strangle it. Um, this is a really vigorous one that we've used, you know, right plant, right place. This is, we wanted this one to be a ground cover in this uh, snow leopard viewing. This one's called Red Wall. Um, Allegheny Spurge. This is a good, you can kind of see, so like the, the leaves from last year stay evergreen and they get this like bright, very cool mottling. And then right on time with all the ephemerals coming up, it sends out its uh, new flush of growth um, that's a lot more green and just a, a nice little ground cover, semi-evergreen with some nice winter interest. Woodland phlox, phlox divaricata. Um, this one right here is probably the most common one that you'll find. It's called Blue Moon. Um, just a really pretty, nice, uh, very early spring bloom with this nice little blue flower. Um, some You can find like white ones now, I think. Witch hazels. Is a fairly large shrub, can be a fairly large shrub um, with this really interesting winter bloom. Um, 
it kind of so it looks for days like today where it's you know above 50 and the um and it kind of depends on the plant like from individual to individual when it's going to come out and season to season because it's kind of looking for like either like the late fall or early winter or times like now where it's going to it's above 50 degrees and anytime it's above 50 degrees the bees are out trying to you know get nectar and things so it's something to be there on on weird weather like this for bees and other you know non-dormant pollinators and it you know sun or shade it it can take pretty dry but it can go very wet as well Pop tree, Telia trifoliata, is a re another really adaptable um, native plant. So it's, it's in the citrus family. Um, it's actually the most northern uh, found member of the citrus family. Got these nice, uh, you know, cool blooms to it. Little like hop looking, uh, hence the name hop tree, little hop looking uh, fruits that you can actually use for brewing. They actually were used as a substitute for hops in brewing. Um, that hop tree you said is in the citrus family. Do the blooms smell like orange blossoms? Um, they're a little musky, oh. I will say. <laughs> right. It's not quite as, uh, as that, but it, it's a really handsome little uh, large shrub, small tree, depending on how you, how you train it um, as it grows. Lady fern, um, this one can be kind of, you know, that this is one that I would really write down the name for because um, there is sometimes it's listed as Dryopterus and sometimes, and there is a Dryopterus filix moss, which tripped me up when I was kind of putting this together. It's like, okay, which one, which one? Um, but just a really, um, this is one of the ferns that can take the most, you know, all ferns like, shade generally, this is one that can take, you know, take it pretty dry as long as it's in the shade. Um, here's another nice little patch of it. You know, with, with more and more moisture, it'll get, you know, larger and larger and everything. Bottle brush buckeye, um, large shrub, pretty shade tolerant. It's got these wonderful, like huge, very attractive to pollinators uh, blooms. And it's pretty good at suppressing weeds, I've found. It's, there, there's just something about it that uh, it really keeps weeds down under it. Um, white wood aster, aster debaricatus. It's a nice little, like slowly spreading, rambling kind of uh, woodland aster. This is one that we use a lot called Eastern Star that's pretty easy to find. Um, just a really good way to kind of brighten up shade to have some nice native, you know, shade flowers. You can also take it pretty dry as well. Um, Virginia bluebells are probably my favorite and the most available spring ephemeral. Um, they're just the easiest, I think, to, to garden with. Um, but just all sorts of, you know, very early spring, all sorts of flower colors from, I've seen kind of like pink, white, blue. Um, May apple, they've got these little, you know, sometimes the best flowers are the ones you kind of have to look for. Um, so these flowers will be kind of hidden underneath the, uh, the foliage, which that's the whole plant right there. And I've seen pretty thick patches, I've seen, you know, thinner stuff, more, you know, less formal stuff like this. Um, it kind of depends on moisture. And the more moist it is, the longer it'll, it is like a semi-ephemeral, I'd call it. And the more moisture you have, the longer it's going to stick around. But um, it will kind of, you know, once it gets, starts getting really hot, it'll kind of say goodbye. Uh, but be back the next year, of course. Um, things that won't, things that will be uh, very evergreen are sedges. So this one, I actually just got um, the Mount Cuba Center um, does all these trialing trials with native plants. They just released their report on uh, their Carex trials. 
So these are some that we've had success with that also scored really high in their in their trials. So Carex Pennsylvanica is this nice, like very fine, grassy looking, um, can take, you know, pretty dry shade, um, evergreen. I wouldn't really cut back Carex. Most of them don't like it. It's kind of species by species, but um, I kind of just leave them alone unless they get really, you know, ratty looking. You might give it a, a very tender cut back, but they're but mostly you just kind of leave them and forget. This is one of my favorite, you know, appearance wise. This is uh, palm sedge, Carex muscingamensis. Um, it's just got this weird kind of geometric shape to it. It kind of comes up and the leaves come out at these like very sharp angles. It's just a really interesting appearance to it. Um, it can take sun with, with moisture um, and it prefers like a moist shade, but it'll handle average garden soil just fine. Plantain sedge is a really common one when you're walking around in the woods. Um, Plantaginea. And uh, all three of those are pretty reliably evergreen. Um, coral bells. So something I learned when I was, you know, kind of putting things together for this uh, presentation is Heuchera is like an exclusively North American genus. So even like the crazy colored ones that you, or like, you know, giant colored bloom ones that you find at the garden center, they're at least like, you know, just an amalgam of different native uh, Heuchera. But, um, if you're trying to make more of like a woodland kind of aesthetic, I really like this one called Autumn Bride. Um, it's just, it has, a, you know, some of the more colored ones aren't quite as, you know, they're good garden performers, but I mean, these things are real, these kind of heuchras are really tough. I mean, you see them literally growing out of rocks in nature. Um, we have this one in, by our, on our um, Night Hunters building by a waterfall, just literally just like shoved into the rock work. And they've done fine for years and years and years. Um, I like the Americana ones as well. Um, we've got those at Foyer Farm. It's kind of, it's that leaf, but it's got this kind of like silver lacing to it. That's it's really nice. Turtle head. Um, this one's called Hot Lips. Um, just another good way to kind of brighten up shade, add some flowers to shade. Um, can't take it too, too dry, but like average garden soil to, to fairly wet. Like I've got some very wet, shady spots in my yard that I'm trying to get this for. Symphora carpus. So this is one called Proudberry um, that I've really liked. Um, most of what you'll see is like the red kind or they've got a white kind. They're two different species. This is a hybrid of the two. Um, clearly it paid attention in that kind of elementary school, uh, art class, you know, white plus red equals pink. Um, and this thing is just a phenomenal, like everything from like full sun, dry to like wet shade to dry shade. Um, you can really put it anywhere. Spice bush, Lindera benzoin, really phenomenal fall color. It's kind of a large shrub. Um, you can't really train it much as a tree. You can do kind of like a multi-stem, but um, phenomenal fall color, really pretty um, blooms. The specific, it's the specific host plant of the uh, spicebush swallowtail uh, caterpillar. The spicebush swallowtail caterpillar can only eat this plant and uh, pretty deer tolerant too. Um, it's just got like a very strong smell to the um, the leaves and the stems that, that I, it doesn't seem to be touched even in very heavy deer pressure. Wild ginger is just a really fun, uh, I, I love those kind of funnel shaped leaves. Just this really nice, uh, well-behaved ground cover. Moving on to kind of pollinating plants. Um, so pollinator plants, when you're making a pollinator garden, you, your goal is to kind of have things blooming from the moment everything wakes up in very early spring and carry you all the way through the year. So that's kind of how I've tried to order this. Um, so one thing that might be surprising is, um, you know, very early spring when perennials haven't even quite gotten going yet. Um, one of the things bees 
do as they're waking up is they go for pollen. And you might think like, oh, maples are like wind pollinated trees. They're not really useful to uh, pollinators. Um, when they wake up in the spring, they want that like very protein rich pollen that helps them get going. And it's one of the only things that's like out there. And another thing is if you think of like the, you know, the volume of a tree and the amount of flowers that a large tree would have, um, it's, it can be like, you know, two pollinator gardens with your pollinator garden under it. So it's, it's a lot of pollen and they're just really attract, like all the way through winter, you've got that like red stem and then it kind of, as they start blooming, it just gets even more like from a distance, it's just like red mist all over the crown of the tree. Um, sugar maple is another one that right around that time, another medium to large tree that's that's going to do the same thing. Um, our native pussy willow, Salix discolor, um, that's a you know a shrub that you could have. Um, it can definitely take more like average garden soil. Um, it might you know even help it kind of rain it in a little bit, not that it's aggressive, but, and I would definitely like cut these back every couple of years to kind of get some new growth going, get more flowers, more, you know, tender new growth. Um, and the genus Salix in general are really, really powerful uh, host plants. There's just hundreds of species of caterpillars and things that raise their young on willow leaves. As we get out into kind of late spring, you've got your red buds. Um, this is one that they are doing a lot of breeding work with, and for good reason. It's just a really nice, small, um, adaptable tree, very tough, um, not very shade tolerant, but, you know, part shade to sun. It's just a really, you can't beat it. Um, there's all sorts of different flower colors that they've brought out here. The white one is Alba. There's reds, like Appalachian red, um, and you've got that regular, like, kind of lavender one all in the background there. Um, there's different foliage colors like rising sun, white water, um, you know, variegation. There's a new one out called like flamethrower. Um, there's all sorts of different, all sorts of different habits. Um, there's a lot of weepers. Um, normally it has like these very upswept branches, but some of these can be really pretty, especially I've seen them like cascading over walls and things. This is kind of the original one, Lavender Twist. It's got like a, just like a normal, um, flower color, but then, you know, it's this like really pretty uh, well-behaved small weeper. And then they're, you know, they're even getting like variegated weepers and like red foliage weepers. And there's, there's a pretty big boom on these in terms of the breeding right now. Crossvine, um, some of the selections, it's generally a more of a Southern plant. I've heard some people say that like certain cultivars, they can't keep alive and what, whatnot through the FOSS. But I mean, I've seen these on the side of the road driving back from Versailles State Park. There's nurseries in Cleveland that offer this. So there's definitely ones that are definitely reliably hardy. We have one, um, I think this is Tangerine Beauty. We've got Tangerine Beauty at the zoo that, um, these are mostly evergreen. It kind of depends on the winter. Um, last winter, very mild. Our tangerine beauty was like completely uh, evergreen. After, you know, the big uh, snowstorm with the negative 10 and the high winds, it's it's fairly defoliated. It's probably, you know, a little less than half. But um, just this really nice, you know, there's like a wasp in there right now, but a really attractive to uh, Hummingbirds and butterflies like that kind of tube-shaped flower. They like, you know, stick their their beak or their proboscis down that. But, it, you know, these are large enough to serve like bees and things as well. And just, they can be just covered in flowers, you know, and they can take pretty good shade. They kind of thin out a little bit. They don't flower quite as much, but I've seen them in some pretty intense shade doing, doing just fine. Uh, Monarda this is another one that there's just, there's so many Monarda right now. Um, all different flower colors, different, you know, habits, foliage, heights. Um, it is a mint family, but I haven't seen it be real aggressive or anything, really. It's kind of, it, you know, it, it plays well with others from what I've seen. Uh, this is one called Jacob Klein. My friend has Jacob Klein, a guy that works with this, at the zoo with us. Um, 
he says when this thing is blooming, it is like the hummingbirds will ignore his hummingbird feeder. Um, this is a nice straight species one, Bradburyana. It's got um, it's like a nice lavender bloom. It's just a really interesting like flower shape too. Garden phlox, phlox paniculata. There's a ton of these coming out, different kinds. This one's a, a really nice one called Gina. Um, I talked about that pollinator cultivar study with uh, Doug Tallamy. This one was actually shown, there's something about like the shape of, the, there's like a slight difference in the shape of the flower that this is like head and above favored by butterflies over the straight species. So it's just a really nice uh, butterfly attractant. Purple cone flower getting kind of into the, you know, more of the early to midsummer. Um, one that, you know, this one's been popular with breeding and every in nurseries and everything for a long time. And it, they're only bringing out more and more. Um, all sorts of flower colors and things, even like bicolored flowers these days. This is one called Fragrant Angel. Um, I mentioned those Mount Cuba Center trials. This one is, um, they do not only garden performance, but pollinator visitation. And this one was like slightly edging out all the others in uh, pollinator visitation. Once again, there's just something about it that it's it's been selected to be, there's just something they like about it. Um, every pollinator garden, you pretty much, you know, you, you wanna have a milkweed of some kind. Uh, I think the most dependable garden performer is uh, Incarnata, the swamp milkweed. Um, it, you know, the name swamp, it, it behaves pretty good in uh, average garden soils as well, you know, but it can definitely take it pretty wet. It's, um, hyssops, um, agastaches. Um, these things are are wild. I have to move, you know, plants a lot to different projects and stuff. And like loading this into a truck, um, they get like, you know, they obviously when they're grown in a pot, they're not quite as bushy. Bushy. So you know, you'll lift this thing up, and it kind of will just catapult this like, you know, four inch long like column of bees into your face. And, and thankfully, they are so distracted with the bloom that they don't seem to jump off or anything. But it's definitely hair raising to, to move these around. Um, which, yeah, it's just really pretty. Um, it's mint family, so, but like it, it kind of clumps. It's not like a running mint family, but um, definitely one that I have not seen be bothered by deer because that strong scent, when they try to chew on it, they really don't like strong scents. Mountain mint, um, this is, you know, it, it can, you know, give it space. <laughs> and be ready to deal with it but oh my god like I've seen like nursery pictures where they get a picture of the bloom without anything on it and it's like how did you do that how did you find like a moment where this thing wasn't just like I mean it, it's one of those plants that you walk by when it's in bloom and it is like buzzing you can like hear it um another um Hydrangea I want to shout out is uh, Haas Halo. I keep talking about these these Mount Cuba evaluations because they're they're amazing. Um, but this is another one that was shown for like just way up and above in terms of pollinator visitation. I mean, compared to the species, it's just got these humongous flowers and they're just covered for the entire time it blooms. Ironweed. There's a lot of different ironweeds. Um, this is a good one, is uh, iron butterfly, letter manii, but there, there's a number of different species to, to play around with, and they all kind of like some of the same things. Um, so this is uh, goldenrods. Goldenrods are, um, once again, they're really strong host plants. There's just hundreds of um, caterpillars and things that rear their young on these, and uh, they're also very attractive to pollinators. and very attractive to people. This one's called Solar Cascade. If you put it kind of at the front of the border, it will kind of droop down a little bit. So it's nice for, you know, like low walls or curbs or things like that. But if you put stuff in front of it, it'll, you know, that can stand it up, it'll, it'll 
stand up a bit more. Um, this is another one that I like called Fireworks. It's pretty well behaved. It's not quite like, you know, um, Canada Goldenrod, which can get really, you know, out of bounds. And it's got this really cool, it's like an L shape, like it goes up and, uh, you know, it, and it's, when it's dormant and you leave it up in the winter, it's got this very like architectural, very cool, like L shape to it. And just a really fun texture. Um, asters, there's a lot of different asters. Um, this is one that we use a lot, Radon's favorite. Um, there's one called Avondale, these oblongifolius. They're really big. Um, they are perennial, but uh, you know, it's like rivals the size of like small shrubs. Um, but once it gets to that side, it's not, it doesn't like sucker around or anything. It's just, you know, but it's just this really big, like massive blooms, um, in the, the late summer, early fall. This is another one that's, you know, that there's a lot of cultivars for the Note Bay Angeli, the New England Aster. This one's called Purple Dome. So, um, when you're planting by the street, you're, you know, you're dealing with a lot of pollution, you're, you know, um, compacted soil, or saying, you know, people running off the road and things, obviously out of road salt. So, you know, there's kind of two schools of thought that people take into designing like urban forests and street side plantings. Um, so you can kind of do like, you know, there are plants that are more adapted to like dry, soils, they're attracted to, you know, they occur in disturbance. So when that community has been, the, you know, the soil organisms have been scraped away in nature by like a landslide or something, they're the first things to get in. They're not as dependent on it. They can deal with, you know, lower fertility. Um, we share a lot of these species, like in terms of range with the Midwest, which can get, there are places that can get very dry. And because of that, they don't have as much water washing down the naturally occurring like soil salts. So they're generally like, you know, I mean, you can't dump like a bag of salt on these things, but they generally are a lot more salt tolerant than, you know, other plants might be because of that. And they can take, you know, a lot of the more poor droughty conditions. So red bud again, um, really taking off as a street tree. Um, those nice like upswept branches that are easy to prune out of people walking down the street or cars driving by, been under power lines really well. This is one I see more and more nurseries carrying these two and I actually bought one for my yard. Um, Osage orange, when you think Osage orange, you think of like this crazy gnarly thing that like is dropping like humongous green fruit everywhere and is covered in spikes. Um, these two have been selected for like good form, good like tree form. Um, almost completely spineless. Um, I, I'm yet to see spines on them, but apparently they occur and they are males, so they don't drop the giant brain fruits everywhere. Um, this one is being maintained more as a shrub. Um, here's ones, these are white shield that are being um, used in a parking lot, but just like a very tough tree. Um, a nice like medium sized tree, extremely tough. Um, Kentucky coffee tree, this is a huge one, um, is they kind of take, you know, when you buy it from the nursery, I think Mike Durr said like grows from like a nurseryman's broomstick to one of the most graceful native trees. Um, and it's kind of got the, like this winter form because a lot of it, it's got these huge like multi-pinnate leaves. Um, so once those all fall away, it's got this very sparse, but very cool winter form to it. Um, it's bean family. It's got the, you know, interesting flowers as well, if you are able to see them. Um, and because of that, like, thin canopy, because of that pinnate foliage, those tiny leaflets, um, it's uh, probably e a lot easier to, like, grow grass under and things. It's not quite as you know, deep shade is like an oak or something would be. Um, other things that, you know, once again, goldenrods, they're inhabitants of like dry prairies. They can deal with soil salts and things like that. Asters, 
Uh, Black-eyed Susans, Rebecca, there's not just Herda, there's other, you know, species, other cultivars out there. Um, real favorite of mine. Uh, I remember uh, having these in the garden as like a very little kid. This is one of the first plants that I was kind of aware of. So it holds a special place in my heart. Fragrant sumacs. So most of what you're going to find is Grolo. It's like this real little thing. It's actually got some very cool flowers too. But um, Grolo is definitely the most common uh, because it's it, it's very short, nice rambling thing. You don't really want, there's kind of this like window that you want. I didn't um, show a lot of shrubs because you really, you don't want something that's like too high where it's going to block your view. Like if you put it around your mailbox, you're not going to be able to see when you're trying to pull out. Um, or you want kind of a tree that you can kind of limb up and make this window to where when you're driving around it by the, the side of the street. Um, so this kind of fits in that little window and just as a, you see this everywhere in parking lots. It's really taken off. And then the prairie grasses are like the real stars of like salt and pollution tolerance. Um, this is big blue stem, andropogon. Um, these start out like this very like kind of blue green, and then it darkens and darkens and darkens all the way till, you know, fall, it starts turning like red and purple and all, you know, it's just really nice to watch over the, the course of the year. Um, and most of the height is really made up of the, um, the bloom. So, when, you know, for the most of the year, it's not gonna be like gigantic, but it can like bloom really high. Um, so that's kind of where the big blue stem comes from. But most of the year, it's it's actually pretty small. Switchgrass, um, you can kind of see it here in flower. This is another one that is kind of like that steel blue and then kind of shape, uh, not quite in the same way, but turns like a very nice red in the fall and then has just like a really nice like winter um, interest to it. Just this very like wispy, like cool, uh, very striking plant in the winter. Um, I really like this, but it does, you know, keep in mind it does get very tall. And uh, I mean, it can seed around tiny bits, but it's not like anything crazy. And then uh, little blue stem is a really nice one as well. It kind of does like a similar thing where it's going to start off this like nice, almost blue color and then progress to like these really beautiful uh, red tones in the fall and then has just like a very pretty uh, winter habit. And you can see what I'm talking about kind of off to the uh, right of that is that fireworks goldenrod. And then so one of the things that a lot of urban foresters have done with trees is kind of go the other route. So um, living by the street, you have uh, a very low oxygen soil. Another thing, a thing that occurs in nature that can kind of predispose a tree to being good with low oxygen is periodic flooding. So you can kind of go the other way with it. And a lot of our best street trees are plants that are adapted to grow their roots with a lot less oxygen than normal. So some of the kind of like swampier wet trees um, make really good street trees. Black gum, Nissa, this is another one that's kind of really, um, they're doing a lot of breeding work with this. They're very available. There's fire starter and other different uh, cultivars. Uh, really phenomenal fall color too. Really stands out um, either in, you know, like a, like a lawn area or all the way to a more naturalized like edge of the woods kind of thing. Um, and they can get very, they can get pretty tall, but they're, they're slow growers, so they're not generally. So they're not going to, you know, become these huge monsters overnight or anything. Um, swamp white oak is a really popular street tree. Um, pretty much anywhere that has, you know, the space for it, they're putting there. And I mean, this is every urban forester's dream right here is a, is a street like this. Uh, but just a really handsome, really durable oak. Um, I, I just got back from a trade conference and I want to shout out one of my, you know, one of my favorite oaks. And uh, I was really surprised to see like a lot of nurseries with this on their availability, this Quercus lyrata, this overcup oak. Um, 
I really fell in love with the one at, at Boone County Arboretum. And it's just another like bottomland periodic flooding oak. Um, and it also has, you know, a lot of oaks have very like downswept lower branches. This is one that's generally pretty upswept. So um, it's very easy to prune out of traffic. Service berries. Um, I really like the uh, the Lavis kind for like a tree form. There's also like the hybrid uh, Grandiflorus. Um, what's common to all of them is like this beautiful um, show of spring blooms, these just profusion of white flowers for a pretty good amount of time. And then um, turning into these very attractive uh, berries about June, which is hence the name, the other common name, June berry. Um, they're really tasty um, if you can get to them before the birds. I really like them a lot. And then, like I said, kind of, you know, kind of forming our, our formal plant palette, um, our own sort of independent thing. Uh, like I said, like any plant can be formal with the right, you know, maintenance and the right design and everything, but just some things that are some amenable to some of the uh, formal techniques. So Taylor Juniper, this is another one that I really saw a lot of nurseries starting to carry. Um, a very tight, um, like, you know, those uh, kind of pictures of like Italy with like the, you know, the drives lined with like this very tight conifer. Um, so I've been seeing that one more and more. Um, gray owl, um, if you're going, going to shear something into a head or like a juniper into a hedge, um, just make sure that you're kind of staying on top of it. You don't really, it's not gonna back bud very well if you cut into like the real woody thick growth. So you kind of have to keep on top of it with the, um, and try to cut into the foliage mostly. American hornbeam, this is the one that Mike Durr said was like very amenable to pruning and also just makes like a pretty uh, stately specimen. And just some other things that I thought that to me, I think are pretty formal. Um, Baptisia has like this very upright kind of regal appearance to it. It's very, you know, tidy. Um, there's all sorts of different flower colors and things that they're doing with it. Um, this is American goldfinch. They got blue, purple, white, all sorts of different flower colors. Oh, forgot to edit that one. Um, hardy hibiscus, so hibiscus, uh, mosquitoes, and different cultivars of this. Um, just these huge flowers. Uh, I will say that like they can be kind of, uh, they're very slow to come out in the spring. So maybe that's something you plant like an ephemeral under or something to kind of like bridge that gap because they will be slow to come out, but they make a really big impact when they when they do come out. This is one that I, I've seen more and more in kind of like um, modern architecture and landscaping is a uh, equicetum. It's this very weird like uh, like fern relative. This is this very ancient plant. Um, as you can see, they have it contained by the sidewalk. It's very aggressive, but I, I've seen this in, you know, just weird like sidewalk cuts and stuff like that by like new kind of modernish looking buildings. Um, it's a very interesting native plant. It doesn't really look like anything else that you would, you would find out in the woods. And red twig dogwoods, um, mainly Sericea and Stolonifera. Um, just these really nice, beautiful red stems through the winter, and just a pretty dependable garden performer that's that's been around for a while. And then this is just a weird. Uh, this is more to demonstrate. So like, in, it's kind of weird that like we use some European plants. Um, Europeans use a lot of our plants and things that we think of as like weeds and stuff. They use in like these very formal. Uh, ways in their gardens, like coppicing different, there's different weird like variegated cultivars and different stem colors and things that they have. But I mean, you could do this with like a red maple, like not like right after it blooms, but coppicing for anyone that doesn't know is you basically, instead of letting it grow into a tree every year or two, you kind of cut it back to keep it as a shrub. Um, 
So anything that has like cool new growth or like, you know, even like, like the green, like box elders have like these very bright green winter stems and things like that. You can do this with a cottonwood. You could do this with, you know, a, a number of uh, like vigorous native trees. Different plants for screening. Um, this one, this is a, another juniper. Um, this one's called Berkeyi. There's also Glauca. Um, as we kind of struggle more and more with some of the um, Colorado blue spruce with our humidity and the, you know, just the buildup of disease. Um, this is like a pretty good replacement in my mind. It's like nice blue foliage. Um, the thing about junipers is they're not super uh, shade tolerant. So um, you really want them in, in sun. And of course there's like other, you know, they've got these really attractive fruits to them. Um, and I like this, you know, the straight species a lot. There's Taylor, like I said, that real narrow one, if you need like the screen, like a real tight space. Um, if you're kind of like only out in the yard for like most of the year and, you know, or like the warm times of the year, um, that American hornbeam and American beech, um, they'll hold on to their leaves for a really long time in the fall. So, you know, as you kind of, as it gets colder and colder, Colder and you use your yard less and less. Um, these can still offer a, a quite a bit of screening for like a deciduous tree. Um, Eastern arborvitae, through the occidentalis, the one kind of throws me through a loop because occidentalis means like Western. <laughs> it, it seems like they kind of switched that one up. Uh, these are, they're fairly shade tolerant. Um, they will open up a little bit in like full, full shade. But um, the one you'll see a lot and kind of, you know, like very popular is emerald green. I've got it in a container there. Um, and this is this morning. So after that crazy storm, and I mean, I dug this thing up and just plonked it in that pot like a week before that. And so, you know, really cool little one for, um, for like containers and stuff or like small spaces. If you need like a really big one, um, they have, you know, larger ones, not super, I, they're kind of hit and miss with, with deer tolerance. Um, I've seen ones get really hit like th this one I had in the ground for a while and they took a couple bites of it, but I, you know, it just depends on what your deer like and how many there are. Um, so I, I, like I said, I've gone to a lot of these native talks and, um, there's always like, it seems like every single one, there's the uh, the person in the crowd that when it comes to Q&A time, they're like, you know, yeah, my wife and I, we've got this beautiful house, this beautiful uh, backyard, and we just cleared out all the honeysuckle. But um, the problem is now is there's th this crazy guy that lives behind me. I've got no privacy from him. He's out there every morning with the, with the leaf blower. At 6 a.m., he starts with that leaf blower. How do I make this guy go away? <laughs> um, What's the speed of stutter? <laughs> <laughs> but you had the leaf blower. Um, anyway, so, you know, it's like some things that'll take more, you know, evergreen screening plants that'll take more, a little more shade. Um, Ilex opaca, the American holly. Um, just a really pretty, um, nice evergreen tree. Um, pretty available. There's a lot of different selections. Nice red berries, you know, through the winter. Also make good bird food. But uh, they can open up a little bit in like really, really deep shade. It kind of depends on the cultivar and the, the individual that you get and kind of how deep that shade is. Um, Hemlocks, just these real nice, like feathery kind of evergreens, um, very shade tolerant, but, uh, you know, somewhat, I mean, that, that looks like the ghost of, of hemlock past. So, you know, some of these things can open up. They're a little shade tolerant. If you have like, like your yard is very wooded, but you butt up to like your neighbor's yard, um, you could have that like on the edge and then it will you know, it'll get that sun from their yard, but um, it, it's kind of a hard proposition. And uh, 
this plant isn't for everyone, but um, I, I always kind of think, you know, it's one of my favorites, but um, I don't think it's talked about enough. Um, this is our native bamboo. If you didn't know that we have a native bamboo. It's the only native bamboo. It's a, you would think it would be gigantic with a name like But anyway, so, you know, big snowstorm we had. Non-native bamboo, just leaves everywhere, all over the ground. Um, this is yesterday, our um, full shade around an area. And I mean, you can see I, it is a bamboo. It's not for everybody. But in the full shade, this clump's been there for 10 plus years. And it really hasn't gotten too much out of its bounds. It's, it's a pretty small clump. And uh, still just, you know, I mean, it's a little worse for wear, but compared to the other bamboo, it's just completely leafless right now. Something this, to think about. Would this take standing in water for short periods of It time? loves water. <laughs> yeah. So by the river where the river floods, this would yeah. be okay? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a uh, really good bird habitat, too. Um, there's a lot of species of birds that were endemic to these these cane breaks, as they were called. But um, that's all I have for today, but just a few shout outs, our plant for pollinators program. Um, it's super easy to register your garden. You just go to like that, that's place on the, you know, the Cincinnati Zoo website, hit the gardens tab, it's down there. Um, you can register your garden, it's free. You, um, you literally, I mean, everybody in this room definitely qualifies. You just have one, one nectar plant, one host plant. Oh, um, okay. And then you can get that little garden sign. I think it's $20 right now to donate to keep the program going. And you get a little, a nice little garden sign to let people know that, about the, the plant for pollinators program. Um, coming up, April 14th is our Zootanical. Um, it's our big, fundraiser. Um, it's just like a really nice uh, dinner. Let's see, dinner, cocktails, um, meet the horticultural team. There's a guest speaker, Fergus Garrett from uh, Great Dixter. And uh, silent auction. It's just a really fun night, really, you know, nice food and everything. Um, so definitely come on out and help support us. Um, that'll be part of in our peak uh, tulip season as well. So um, come on out for that. Come on out for Tunes and Blooms. That's every Thursday night in April. Um, around that time, starting in March and then through um, through into the summer, we're having a ceramics exhibition too this year. There's a lot of really nice ceramics artists who are integrating um, ceramic art with some of our display beds. So definitely come out and see that. Um, February, we've got our landscaping for the homeowner series. It's not too late to register. It's a series of just five, you know, Zoom presentations with Steve Foltz. That's February 8th to the 1st of March. Um, coming up in March, uh, the 16th is our Sustainable Urban Landscape Symposiums. Um, we've got a lot of different speakers lined up, a really good lineup for, um, for this one. Very affordable and includes lunch. Um, just a real bargain for, you know, like the people you get to see, just some real titans. Um, in that vein, we've got our plant trials day and our native plant symposium. Um, those are kind of uh, date TBD, but as we get closer, just keep watching that, that website. Um, so if you like, uh, you know, talks like these, uh, definitely think about coming out for those. And uh, that's all I got. So uh, big thanks to um, Scott Berline, who let me use a bunch of his pictures um, starting out in uh, the presenting world. Uh, I, you realize just how few pictures you've been taking. And uh, then you go out to try and take pictures and nothing has leaves on it or flowers because it's January. And uh, so it was a huge help to me. Um, and just shout out to Boone County Arboretum and uh, everyone that that's uh helped me so thanks
Any questions? You have one from our, our Zoom chat so far. From Lori, I have an area that is always wet and the rains become a creek. Are there any plants like that? Are, are there any plants that like that in our um, so for sun, I would definitely go with like willows. Um, a lot of those uh, sedges that I mentioned are really good, like the mesquingamensis, the uh, palm sedge. Um, and that with, you know, with moisture will take either sun or shade. Um, um, clethra or summer sweet, um, that can go pretty much sun to shade with moisture. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars of that, of like various sizes. It's a good, it's pretty consistent bloomer and shade. Um, Itea is another good little shrub. That's a sweet shrub. Um, a nice little well-behaved uh, suckering native shrub. Once again, you know, sun to shade with, with moisture. And a lot of native ferns would, would like that uh, environment. Aronia. Aronia as well, yeah. Those are uh, choke berries. You need those as well. I, I'd probably do them more in jams than uh, straight off the plant. But um... I have a question here. Uh, you started to speak to this earlier in your talk, but I'd like to go back to it. And that is cultivars. And I'm showing my ignorance of plants here, but how does there's, when I go shopping, there are a zillion cultivars. What makes a cultivar? not native anymore. <laughs> if a plant starts out native, does it become non-native? No. So most cultivars are either selected from the wild or, well, all cultivars. They're either selected from wild plants. And it's just, you know, it's like if you could cut off your fingertip and clone that into like, you know, a thousand of you, and then you regrew your fingertip without, because plants are weird. They don't follow our rules. So it's basically you find, you know, it was like, oh, man, I really like that guy's, you know, the color of that guy's hair. I'm going to clone him like a million times. And, you know, it, it's kind of like that. So it's just it's like one cloned set of genetics. Sometimes it's like a seed strain, like the vegetables. But usually it's done through through cloning. And uh, I, I mean, they're selected from native plants. Um, sometimes there's hybridizing and, you know, that I can't really speak to like hybridizing between like native and non-native species. But a lot of the stuff that I talked about here today is pretty much like the cultivars are hybridized between different native species. So, I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but if something is, you know, eats hibiscus and you take two native hibiscus and a lot of these hybrids like that occur in nature too. So it's not some weird unnatural process. It doesn't do anything weird to them. Um, just like I said, you know, if you're trying to, if you're really honing in on pollinators, maybe don't do double flowers. If you're really honing in on host plants, maybe avoid some of the red foliage. But um, yeah, I mean, they're just, they're just, you know, consistent. You know what you're getting into with it. You know what size it's going to be. You know what it's going to handle and things. Any other question? Mm -hmm. It appears that a lot of pictures or Scott's pictures was, was from Rockdale Academy. Can you tell us a little bit about your project over there? Was? Yeah, so the Rockdale Academy. Um, yeah, so for people on Zoom, um, a lot of those photos were from our Rockdale Academy. It was a question about the Rockdale Academy garden. Um, the Rockdale Academy garden is a garden that we built. Um, over the course of, I think, 2020, it, it all, it's running together, 2020, 2021, a little bit. And, you know, it's an ongoing thing, which further blurs the lines. But um, essentially, we partnered with um, a school in Avondale to turn two acres of um, unused space, just a grass field, um, and we spent all summer building it into this massive garden where the kids can have outdoor class, um, learn about nature. It's a huge, you know, pollinator and bird habitat. There's vegetable beds where they can learn where their food comes from. Um, 
and this is, you know, it's a, it's an inner, inner city school where like these kids don't always have access to, they can't go out in their backyard and just run through the woods and stuff. So it's really powerful for them to know, you know, to learn about nature, to have a place where they can go and, and see nature in action. Um, because that's not always, um, an option for every kid out there. And so it's been a, um, like I said, it's a huge garden. Um, there's like every kind of fruit tree and bush and everything that grows in Ohio, you know, that you can grow in Ohio, um, an amphitheater, you know, and the idea is basically like not even just their science class, but, you know, their art class can go out there and they can say, pick your favorite flower and draw it. You know, your math class can go out there and, um, you know, you can count, you know, different plants and things. And, um, so it's been a really powerful thing. I remember at the ribbon cutting that a girl ran up on stage and they gave her the microphone and she said, I love this garden because we learn about something in the science classroom and then we get to go out here and see it. And uh, so just a really awesome project that um, we've had the, the pleasure to be a part of and and it still keeps going. We've hired a, like an entire full-time position, someone to like look over that garden and make sure that it's, just getting better and better through the years. So really glad to, uh, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> by the zoo. Yeah, it's, it's just two blocks from the zoo. Um, so if you're, if you're ever out at the zoo, it's just a couple of blocks off of, uh, Dury Avenue. So right by, right down the road. We have, uh, two hollies, the evergreen hollies, the tall, narrow ones, I can't remember the name of them. Um, they're about seven years old, but there's a lot of cold. All the leaves are dropped off. Is the, is the roots affected or is it just the leaves that are affected? Um, you'll kind of see in the spring. Um, I will say that it, there's probably, you know, it's kind of hard to tell because, you know, like an American holly, that's, that's nothing. They'll, they'll just leaf right back out. But, um, um, like some of the other, you know, like the hybrids and stuff, um that are from a little further south um those i've seen like um get killed down to the roots but they'll you know they've got a lot of energy stored up and they should come come back up you just might have to cut back that that top growth and let them re-sprout but okay. they should be back thank you yeah well, thank you very much for coming out to visit with Ed and uh, us staff members from the Boone County Arboretum. Uh, thank you to all the people who attended via Zoom. At one point, I noticed our count online was up to 98 people. So in addition to probably about 40 people here in the audience, it was about a very well attended event. So Thank you to Ed and uh, the rest of the zoo staff for letting Ed come out to visit with us today. And uh, we will see you at our next event. Thank you.